Joe, it's a pleasure to be here with you at this conference in Crete uh, on the physics of fine tuning. I've followed fine tuning for many decades. It's an area I have, uh, I have focused on uh, in my personal interest. Um, and originally it was really discussions among philosophers uh, and then perhaps involved in the science religion debates, some scientists, believers, non-believers, etc. What's fascinating to be here is this conference is mainstream cosmologists and physicists. So why has fine-tuning now suddenly, to me, my perception, suddenly become an issue for mainstream cosmologists? Okay, so it's been around for a long time in cosmology. I mean, there was a key moment, I think, in um, 1974 when a guy called Brandon Carter yeah invented what came to be called the anthropic principle. In yeah. fact, he named it that way. And that is basically, you know, you know, the universe seems to be a special place that led to the origin of life. Why? What is special about it? You know, and, um, and that, you know, there was very much a minority of cosmologists who took this serious enough to write papers on it that went on for a while. But it was only, I would say, in the past decade with the discovery of the acceleration of the universe and the need for Einstein's cosmic constant that it got a big boost. And the reason for that is simply that the expected value of Einstein's constant um, from simple arguments about the beginning of the universe um, to scaling arguments really to do with the vacuum energy is so much larger than we actually value, measure imagine now. Um, by many, many hundreds of orders, a hundred orders of magnitude or more, yeah. depending on how you count exactly. So that's one problem. There's a related problem, namely the universe has been accelerating only very recently. That's also a, only a, the, the past few billion years has this weird vacuum energy, Einstein's lambda, taken over. Um, and so you wonder why, why now? What, what's so special about the present time? So those are two questions connected with each other that have led to the revival of fine-tuning. What is special about the universe? And um, that, that's led to um, uh, this major debate which has dragged in inflation theory, I would say reluctantly at first because from its you know, discovery in 1981 by Guth and Lindy it was soon felt to be an effective theory that explained um, certain problems of the universe, why it was so big, um, where the fluctuations came from that made the structure. And then um, in more recent years we've had these wonderful microwave background experiments that have measured the properties of the universe and verified one or two predictions of the inflation theory. And so that's been, that's been great. But then the inflation theory also seems to make a fairly general prediction that's been realized in the past few years that our universe isn't special. Inflation could occur at different places at different times. Um, most likely did occur in the fairly generic version of the theory. And therefore, um, there should be what has been called the multiverse, many other universes. Revitalization of inflation theories over the recent years led to the argument that there should be many areas of the universe which inflated and led to separate universes. And so this gave birth to a multiverse. At the same time, we have this puzzle as to why Einstein's vacuum energy density, which it came to be called, his lambda, was so small. And so combining the two approaches, the hypothesis is very natural to many people, that m many of these universes, most of them, perhaps an infinite number could, could be predicted, wasn't clear, it isn't clear, um, could have different values and only this very unlikely one happens to be the value in our pocket of the universe where we live which has led to the emergence of stars and planets etc because we know that if, if the lambda quantity were much too large the universe would be expanding so rapidly that structure, we couldn't have structure. We couldn't have structure. All this precision cosmology is totally dependent upon the cosmic microwave background. You were there from almost the beginning so Tell us the story. So I was lucky, basically. Um, I was a graduate student at Harvard in 1964, so I went there. And that was the very year that the microwave background was discovered. 
um, by Penzias and Wilson, and recognized by another group at the same time to be the cosmic primordial fireball in the universe. Now, it so happened that my thesis advisor believed in the cold universe. He refused to believe the microwave background could, could be cosmological. But I, you know, was a pretty obstinate student, yeah. okay? And, you know, at first I worked a bit on his model with him, and then I went off in my own direction. And I got inspired a couple of years later when I went to um, a summer school in Woods Hole um, on fluid dynamics. Oh. Um, it was about oceans, it was an oceanography institute in fact, but they had a summer school for all, all people doing this sort of thing. And I got inspired by the early universe. That seemed to be a great place to study these equations because one had a fluid. The fluid was the radiation of the universe right. suddenly becoming transparent and beaming to us in these microwave photons. So I thought, let me look at the interaction, how the radiation broke free. And so that was my thesis project that I oh. finished in 1968. And I predicted that um, in addition to seeing this radiation, there had to be tiny ripples in it, differences from place to place, in order to explain the galaxies that we live in. Because had there not been these fluctuations, structure could never have formed in the expanding universe. You are homogenous. Uh, exactly. And so this inspired experimental searches for the fluctuations. And the first limits were like, you know, 10%. Um, but the prediction said they had to look much, much harder. And so time went on, 20 years passed, actually, more than 20 years. And this was done by balloons? Um, ground experiments, then balloons, and then finally space experiments in 1990 with the COBE satellite. Yeah. And the problem really was the theory kept getting slightly more refined, so it was though the experimentalists were chasing a slightly moving target. But eventually, in 1990, the breakthrough came with the COBE satellite and the, a level of one point in 100,000. They measured these, um, the, the first indications of fluctuations. And then it took another 20 years or so before they pinned down the fluctuations that I really had been predicting all along, those that came from the structures that we live in, from the galaxies themselves. Um, and so that was, um, you know, just wonderful success at the end of the day to, to see the signatures of these in the background. Because uh, the cosmic microwave background with the fluctuations that you currently have is really the most, is, is that the most precise um, uh, way that we can see the early universe? There are other technologies, but isn't that the, the, the best precision at this point? Right now, it's the ultimate precision for seeing our cosmic origins, basically, and these fluctuations from which all galaxies and larger structures emerged. We measure those, you know, to fractions of a percent. Uh, but you're saying that we've, we've, we've exhausted that because the, the number of photons that you can collect is, is limited. That's right, the number of photons and the number of patches on the sky yeah. that you can possibly see before you run into the following problem that the fluctuations are a little bit like ripples on the surface of a pond in the radiation and they damp away, they die away. And we've run into that point. We're seeing the smoothing out of the fluctuations as they escape from the early universe. And so we can't do any better than we have now without running into much more complex issues in astrophysics. And so to get back to the beginning, we probably have to think of more clever tricks.